Well, I'm going to try to do this video with my uh, tablet. I'm not used to it, so bear with me as my camera went south. Today we have the BSA. It's a Lightning XLSE. We were trying to get the gun back to where it needs to be. I started about a year and a half ago and got frustrated with it. And now we're picking it back up. I have a potential buyer who wants it. He likes these things. A lot of guys love these guns and they're supposed to be very accurate. So if you bear with me, we'll get into this and we'll get you all caught up to speed. Well, it's a BSA Lightning XLSE. It has a gas ram. Um, it has two pins. One pin holds the barrel block to the receiver. The other pin is for the jam to catch on. And the pin just slides in and out. But the third time into this gun and out of the gun, the, the pin started to mess up on me. And that gave me a little frustration a year and a half ago. And basically, um, you know, I ended up putting the gun down. But now we're getting back into it. I just simply made a new pin, blackened it. And now we're ready to go again with this gun. So let's get into it. I got you all caught up to speed. Well, we did get a new gas ram for it. And this one's the more that has more power. Uh, see if you can see the reference number of 36060. And the other one that was in the gun was the low powered gas ram. And you can see the number on that if I get it ready for you. Let's see. That would be 37280, if I got it right. Um, but anyway, we got a new gas ram way back then. Had to wait for it because of the COVID, and we finally got it. And here we are getting the gun back together again. So let's get into this. As far as the um, barrel, it's a good barrel. It's been cleaned. I did a pellet to bore test, and it's a good barrel, which surprised me. Because in the barrel block area, when you do the pellet to bore test, it gets squeezed a whole bunch. And it told me that most likely, once we get past it, it's going to have free fall because the pellet's being squeezed too much. But to my surprise, I was shocked. The pellet has pellet to bore contact all the way through the bore. I couldn't believe it. And good contact, too. Now, the barrel comes in about probably up to here. Don't hold me on that, but that's what I kind of remembered. Has a nice steel shroud, right, with some knurled uh, fittings here, fittings. And then here's uh, one that comes out and has a knurled area here and a knurled area there. Nice steel shroud. It wiggles a little bit, but I can't get it off. And I didn't feel like heating it and keep going further to get it off. I just simply left it alone at that point. So there it is. We have a decent barrel. Now on the gun... We see that it says, if you can see that, I don't know if you can or not, BSA guns, UK, LTD, England, 0.22 cal, and it has its serial number there with uh, 12 to 16 J's, which is Jowls. I believe that's what they use in the UK for their power level, right? Jowls or jewels, however they say it. I think it's just simply a low-powered gun. Now, we were trying to get this to get more feet per second than what it had back then. So now we're picking it up. We're getting it back in there. we got the pin squared away. We're good on that. I will say, you know, um, you can take a Viroc apart all day, every day for the rest of your life, and it will come apart, and you'll get it back together again with no problem. But here's a BSA gun with a couple pins to pull, and what do you get out of that? You get trouble. And also the receiver tube, I checked that, right? So I had an internal bore gauge. I checked the inside bore, and that came up to be 29 millimeters inside for the air chamber. Back here where the receiver entrance was, was a lot smaller, coming in around 28, I'm going to say 28.7. So I had to hone all that out, and finally it was reading 29 millimeters. But at any rate, this is the stuff you run into when you work on air guns. Now, we're all set to go. Everything else is looking good, and I did change the porthole on it back then, so looking further into that when we picked it up, I got rid of it and redid the porthole. I don't know if you can see that or not. Now the portholes to a size, I believe, is going to work for the gun. So what I did was look to see what had what for porthole sizes on something like this. I found the Gamo 790, right? I measured that. And the original bit that I did the porthole in was 3.10 millimeters. I thought that would be good to start with. But as I got into this second time around, I realized I think it's going to be too big. Now, the other thing that really helped me out was I have an R1 in the shop, Beeman R1, that I was working on at this time. I forgot all about it. Sitting here, I did some Cerakote to it. And I looked at that porthole, and I thought, wow, look at that. 
that porthole is small too. My, what is it, 3.10 millimeter bit would not go in there. So I went and got some smaller bits from Ace Hardware. And I got a couple of them. And this is the one we wound up using. I don't know if you can read that or not. 2.95 millimeters. Now that goes in here, right? And I guess 3 millimeters would have been ideal. But you have to start with whatever you get. And a lot of times when you go to drill a hole, it's going to actually make it bigger than what you want it to anyway. It won't be that exact size of the bit. So I think we're going to be pretty good with going on with that. Now the line is up, right? Remember, this is... 29 millimeters inside diameter and typical r1 is going to be 30 millimeters and if you look there just visually we're pretty darn close so we should be good with that size porthole but anyway i think we're going to be good now that leaves us with now that we have a good barrel now we got the pin all straightened out and now we are heading in the right direction we got a more powerful gas ram right well now what else does that leave us well it leaves us the heart of an air gun or at least one of them is the piston seal now here is the original piston seal it's very thick it had a rubber shock washer behind it similar to this one um, which is torn in half in my other lower shop and you can see it had a small button on the piston right which this slipped up over this is very hard it's disgusting and if you measure it which we will in millimeters it measured 29.57 okay now we can do it so it drops 29.6 and that's what we got that's so disgusting i hope the day comes around where these are never made ever ever again but at any rate, now we are going to upgrade and get a proper seal in this gun. And so for that, we took the piston, took the button off the piston, redid a new button for the same button configuration that was off of a Diana 34 piston. Right? Now, as far as the seals, I had a bunch of Diana slash RWS seals. One for the 350, one for the 48, one for the 34, one for the 36, and a Diana 430L under lever. And when I pulled them out, I didn't get to the gun jet, but I did have the seals on hand. I found some seals were smaller and others were bigger. So let's just see what we have here. Let's measure this one. We'll zero this out. And to my surprise, right, I found one that was... 28.96, 29, 29.06, 09, 29.11, 29.12, .11, and I figured, you know what, we could do something with that. Now, I have no idea which one of those Diana's go for. It's either going to be my guess, the 350. Maybe the 48, I don't know. But at any rate, we got one out of the bunch that's bigger. The other ones were, were a lot smaller, just if you want to know. Let's see. Coming in at um, 28.24. Or 28.4. See? So at any rate, there it is. We have a seal we can work with. Now, the idea was to redo the button to match the Diana 34. I gave it a little extra so we can put, I hope you can see that. You'll see pictures coming up with a little cushion underneath of it, just like the original one. And if you look at the thickness between the original piston seal and what we got going, so far, we're only as thick as the original seal was. So we should be looking pretty darn good. Maybe even a little swept by them, extra swept by them. But anyway, we got it done. Now we can measure that. We'll zero this out. Twenty nine point six four, right? So we are looking really good, and that's what's going to get this gun back to where it needs to be. So there's some pictures, there's some video clips. I'm not too sure how it goes together. But we'll get it together so we can finish this film. We'll see what happens with this particular gun. And there it is, the BSA Lightning XLSE. Um, very cool grab-and-go gun. Anyway, here's the fork. I'm not too sure if this area in here, one of these days I should look into that. I have a feeling that this area is actually on a slight taper. Um, just because when I had the square insert in there, um, one side is closer to the top where the other side is actually a little lower. And that shouldn't be. It actually should be totally even. 
Now, as far as the O-ring making a seal around all that, we should be fine and dandy. I hope you can see that. Because of the round diameter of the O-ring should be in the steel part of all this. But anyway, that's where we are. Appreciate you hanging out. Let's find out what we get out of this gun. All right, see, well, it's time for a picture show. Here's the piston inside the lathe where we just machined the piston button off. And then we start to drill our piston out, but then the uh, piece remaining started to move a little bit. So now we have to drill and pin it in here in order to keep that from moving. So now we're into the mill machine where we're drilling it out. And we got our hole drilled. Now she's back in a lathe. You can see traces of the pin that we pinned it with. And we can now finish boring this and drilling it out. And there we are there with our hole. Now we can press fit our button that we're going to put in there and finish the button. Pictures are out of sequence, but there's my new target board where I moved it and set it up to 42 yards now. Shooting from my shop window back here, um, which is way back here. This is my 18 foot target board. And we're back in the lathe and what we're doing here is we're cutting off the extra piece of the button that we're not going to use and then we're going to machine the new button with what's left over it's all been figured out and there it is there there's the face of it and there's another shot of it so now our new button back in this area here has been made a little longer because we're going to put a washer which is going to act as a buffer behind the piston seal and there it is there remember i said that the original seal had one and this washer and the um, piston seal is actually just as thick as the original piston seal was and then that had a washer so we're looking pretty going good here with this gun we actually have a wee bit more uh, swept volume now but not much I don't think it would really make a difference. There's the face of the piston looking really nice. And this is our air chamber porthole all machined up, ready to go into the receiver. I believe it wound up being 0 0.2, what was it? 0.297 millimeters of a hole. There it is going in with a red Loctite. And I have a feeling at the bottom of this, is on a slope because one end of the air chamber porthole is flush and the other end is showing a little bit of a lip which is recessed but the um, breech seal on the gun actually goes around the steel part not the brass so we are okay in that respect and here the pin is coming out uh, it was cooled off in some oil after being heated up to blacken it and there it is there um, when it was dropped in and that's the end of our picture show well i forgot so, uh, that some of you guys may not know how to get this in and get the gas ram pushed back well it's simple you just make a little tool like this now this is made out of aluminum what it's going to do is get past the bar right and it's going to push into the gas ram push it up and out of the way give it some preload and then we'll be able to install our pin so if you don't have aluminum you can go to your um, home depot and get a brass three quarter inch brass nipple that works out too uh, so you can just get your grinder with a cutoff wheel and do your notching uh, and do it like that but um we got one here made out of aluminum so let's get this in so we're already in we're all ready to go uh, obviously this is going to go in there like that I'll just put my little piece of steel. Hope you can see this when we get all set up. Okay, now where are we here? Should be ready to go. See, now you can't see. What are we going to do about that? All right, let's get this back. Let's get this up a little bit. And we'll just turn it that way. Make sure we're turned here. Like this. Mm, looks like we got.
got it there. And then we're going to stick our little piece in there that we talked about earlier. Of course, this is in the way, so now i got to turn that. Let's get a pair of pliers. Okay, just a wee bit. It looks like it's going to clear. Now, sometimes these could be tricky, so when you're trying to get it to the other side, bear with me. It's been a while since I did one of these. I'm also forgetting I don't have my cordless mic. Uh, you can grab a magnet, a strong magnet. Just wiggle this around. And now you'll notice over here, um, there's two holes. I don't know if you can see them or not. But um, they need to be upright. And then that should put you where this thing needs to be. And of course the proof would be in the pudding when you bring it back to see if it's seated. Let's find out. There's that. Need my little flashlight and watch your magnets you see that can you see that that's why you need shop glasses because everything with a magnet or even some of the tools you lay down will pick up metal pieces and we don't want metal pieces going in where metal pieces don't belong so right here on the edge of the gun you can see some stuff sticking up i guess i should have wiped it first but i didn't think about it all right so we're in there's that. I hope this camera's picking up the vocals. Uh, we are good to go. We are where we need to be. I don't think you can see that, but we are where it needs to be. Now we'll get the trigger set up. Okay, let's take a look at our target board here. Let's see if I can get in here. Okay, now this is the nonsense that you get when you buy an air rifle. So what did you pay for this rifle? 300 some dollars. I don't know what they're going for. But we were aiming right here somewhere in the middle here and this is where we landed now the good news this particular gun because of the power ratio is very low um, it's very accurate even though it does have some issues which we're going to get into okay so here's our point of impact this is where we were aiming at that is disgusting we're not going to have it we're not going to deal with it we're going to fix it so we already started, we, we bent the barrel, we were able to remove the shroud and destroy it to, in order to get it off, but we'll have to fix that too. So we wound up bending the barrel, so the point of impact is now here, right? We were aiming, uh, I believe, uh, over at this dot. So we were able to shift it this way and then up more. And then I switched over here, and then you can see these three here. And this is with a crappy trigger. Um, so we're grouping and we're getting closer and now finally we are around where the bullseye is So now I would say the barrel is adjusted where it needs to be now We got to fix the shroud and continue on with this rifle and fix the rest of it. See it on the next clip All right, well, we were able to get the shroud off but not without ruining half of it And now we have to refinish the shroud. So we're prepping it here for Cerakote and now the barrel, in order to bend the barrel to change the point of impact like we did, the barrel's only from here to here um, because this part is on the welded block. So this is the only area we can use to bend the barrel. And it was really tricky. I didn't think we were going to be able to pull it off, but we did. So now we're going to have a problem once we configure to put this all back. Now the part that goes back here that's tapered that swings up to this round has been destroyed in order to get this gun off. So I have to make one of those. But anyway, here's what the configuration looks like. This part just sits on here. There's your factory crown. They did do some machine work there. Um, and this stabilizes the tube on this end. 
and then back here you had the piece that went into the back of the shroud that screwed into it but that piece used to have an allen that locked the shroud but now the shroud itself was was rambling and rattling and it wasn't tight and i couldn't get it snugged up so in a way we're going to be better off now than we were in the beginning so i'm going to need to make a new piece for this which we'll do out of probably black delrin why I take these here and Cerakote these parts to put a nice finish on them. And then we're going to get to the trigger on this. Now, the trigger on this was absolutely horrible. I put a longer screw in it and I changed the spring in there. And I still do not like what I'm seeing and feeling. So we're really going to have to go in deeper and try to figure out what do we need to do to make this trigger acceptable and safe. Meanwhile, we're going to get rid of this because this is no longer in function. The part that it attaches to is broken, and we're not going to send them away to UK to buy it for another 50 bucks for shipping. So I talked to the owner. Um, I sold the gun, and he says he don't care. Get rid of it. And I said, good, we'll make it disappear. And that's where we're at right now. But at any rate, uh, as far as the shroud goes, once we bent this barrel the way we did, which was around this area here, that's going to change the trajectory when the pellet leaves. So the tube basically goes up to what used to be an adapter back here. I'm going to say probably around here where it's screwed in. Left around three inches of an empty space in the tube. And by the time that pellet reaches its point of going through this adapter here, um, most likely it's going to be clipping this. So what I did was um, knew ahead of time, I, I drilled that out a little bit bigger, but because this side's threaded, I didn't have that much I could do, but I did do some boring. And then I colored it all in with a red magic marker, put it all together. I had some type of an adapter back here that we can put the shroud on. I shot the gun and so far the magic marker wasn't disturbed. And then I took this guy here, this is the normal hole that you see, but the front was a little smaller and I made that bigger to cover the base. Just put that all together, put a zeroed out uh, scope on the gun. I shot it several times and the pellet is doing fine. It's not clipping or running into the ends there where it passes through the hole. So we are all good to go. But anyway, we're gonna get this Cerakoted and then get this all back. I gotta make a piece for this and that's where we're at. And then we're gonna work on the trigger and hopefully get something done for it. Thanks for having okay, me. Okay, we are going to talk about this trigger in this gun. Well, so far we got the gun really looking good. Now it's down to the trigger, and this trigger is absolutely horrible. So let's take a look and see what I did with it. Now, I want to tell you that what I do and share is on me. I'm not telling you to do anything, and you are responsible for whatever you put your hands to to do, not me. I'm just simply sharing what I did and my findings. I'm looking for the original trigger. Here it is here. So you can see I have an aluminum trigger in there and I'm not done with it yet. It needs to be cut down and, and uh, sanded a little bit more. But let's take a look at this trigger. So you have your cover right there and it has two screws and it's already off. There's the screws, but the screws are right there. One there, one there. You undo the screws and then this will come off. Just jiggle it around. Now on the other side of this is this guy here. The little, the little recess pocket is so that it goes over the pin there that's on the trigger blade. See it? That little pin. Now our trigger doesn't have this. This is for the manual safe, which that part we talked about earlier on in the clips was broke and we weren't using it. So we didn't need that. That's why our trigger looks different. Now on the original trigger... Um, this would have to go all the way down until it hit this area here, which is right there, and then push the uh, sear down to fire. And on the other side of this trigger is where the spring was that gave it some spring action. The spring simply clipped in there and snapped between these two prongs and came out this way. And then when it was in and on the post center in the hole back there is another hole for that post to drop into. Basically, the sear spring or the trigger spring came down on top of the sear and basically gave it a little bit of spring tension. As far as sear tension, you are stuck with it. Um, it's this wire here, let me push this down in there. It's this wire and the wire goes on the bottom side over here and then pokes its head up this way and gives this tension, right? 
let's take a look at that. See? Um, on this side, right, it goes around and on top, let's push this down, of this sear. Now, this guy here, I'm not too sure what this does, um, but basically it's a part that's in the, that locks in the trigger right there, so it keeps it going straight down on top of that square. And my guess is when the piston comes back and hits this, um, it just keeps this from popping up too far. See that? Uh, let me check my phone, right? Give me a second. Okay, it's Thanksgiving time and people are saying happy Thanksgiving. So at any rate, um, you're stuck with the factory wire here because, the, and it's horrendous. There's a lot of tension on that, and you can't change it. Again, this spring here is just to give you some spring for the trigger blade. Now, you have an adjustable screw here, and you got to be very careful with that. Because that pushes down on the sear, and when this goes down, this goes up. And when this goes up, it changes the engagement here. The two lines, see how the lines are of engagement. So this gets pushed back from the piston coming back into it, and then the piston's going to want to fire, and then it catches like that. And if this goes up too far, it's not going to be able to hold this, and she's going to fire when you close the barrel, depend upon how you screwed it in. Now, this is a different screw that I tried originally by putting a longer screw in there. I changed the spring on the trigger blade. That's what I did originally, and I lubed it up, and it just wasn't working. Now, I don't know what's happening online out there, but I would not mess with this in sears here, how they are shaped, because they're already barely catching if you take a look at that right so it's up to you boo boo but i'm just telling you these are my findings now at any rate here's my new trigger blade i just got to trim it down you can see the spring on the back side could have been going down straighter but it's it actually works just fine i'm not worried about it but um i just need to clean this up and there it is in a nutshell so remember when you got to put this back make sure you are lined up on that hub there because that's is going to drop into that hole right there and keep that other side of the trigger blade there. And if you're curious, I could pull this out. Let me pull this out real quick. Since we are talking about the trigger, we'll pull this out. You'll see on the other side, I just simply made a, a channel for the spring to sit in. Something similar. And then we have that. And um, let's move this guy out of the way. And it's nice and lubed up. Lube does not hurt. So it's nicely lubed up. It's going to work really well. But anyway, that's it in a nutshell. Thanks for hanging right, out. We are see ready to put this good. all back. Let's see, where is the camera? We're just about making it. How's that? All right, well, there's your trigger. Here's your U-shaped part that's going to line up against the pin that's holding the gas ram in. Now, once you slide this in, you, if you get it all the way up there, that sear's going to catch the back of that gas ram flange, and then it's going to keep this from coming out. See, that lifts up like that. But at any rate, um, the back of the trigger, remember you have this little square piece. It looks just like that. It just goes in there like that. You can put it in after you get the trigger in. Slide the trigger unit in. This is going to go around that pin, and you'll hear it click. That's the sear. Hear that? So now she's caught. Now, in order to get that out, you got to lift that sear up and jostle it a little bit and play with it like that. And then she'll come out. So now she's in there. You can stick this little square piece in. It lines up with the holes on the side. like that then you can put this little trim piece on see that little trim piece there it's a half shell stick that on the bottom like that and then push that in and now you'll see the holes lining up take a look through there and if you don't see it all the way clear that means that little black piece is is pushing its way out the small square one that we put in and then put your big retaining pin in okay now, if she's uh, in halfway and gives you problems because it's all new, just give it a tap with your hammer. But basically, look through the hole. When everything's lined up, you can stick the big retaining pin in. And now the trigger's in. You can move to the next thing, which is the safety here. You don't have to set the trigger or do anything like that. This is ready to go. 
Now, as far as this trigger adjustment, I'm not up on these, but I did see the little retaining screw there. Um, I'm going to say that that could be this screw for the trigger tension, okay? I unscrewed it a little bit because it was all the way in. I unscrewed it a couple turns, so once I get the stock on and start to shoot it, I'll see which way does what for me. Um, but anyway, there it is there. It's a Phillips screw. Now this uh, safety here, this is the manual safety. I think we talked about that. That part's broken, so that's no longer a part of our gun, but I'm going to leave this on. So as far as the safety go, this is the safety when you break the barrel back that you can't shoot the gun because this will not allow the trigger to go down. Here's what it looks like. Let's see, are we in the camera? Good. Um, this is the side that goes towards the bottom. You'll see a little catch there, right? So this is going to look like this. And then once this is in, you'll see that it has a slot here. So the, this is going to be spring loaded. And once you cock the gun, this will slide back and prevent you from pushing the trigger down all the way. See that? Once the barrel's back, this will go back with it and then you can fire the gun. So this has to face up and this has to face towards the trigger um, just like that. Now here you have one, two, three, four little places where this slips and slides underneath of it. And this has the little L-shaped bent piece that's going to go into your cock and arm. So let's break the barrel open just to get the, the cock and arm to be able to come back a little bit more. And then there's a hole in that cock and arm pin. It goes like this, stick it through and then turn it. Um, and then slide it back and then through like this. Now, if your gun's new, this could possibly be on the stiff side, but we've been in and out of the gun a couple of times, so it's no longer stiff. All right, so now that's in, ready to go. At this point, you can close the barrel, I believe. Well, just for now, let's just leave it alone. So here's that little L-shaped piece I was talking about that grabs that little tip underneath. Just lay this here on on tuck this underneath the part just like this and then push uh grab um the post here center the spring on that post just like such now right here let's get a little guy here is a little u-shaped part and that's so that the spring can spring around over here and go underneath of it and that's going to hold the spring down and then you'll see so now, so far so good but remember, keep your finger on this so your spring don't go flying. Get it up underneath like that. And now she is ready to go. Okay? She's all in. So let me close the barrel. And you see now she is back. So when I open the, open the gun... You can see now the trigger can't fire. When I close the gun, she pulls back and now I can fire. So the little retaining spring that has that little little catch underneath there is enough spring since it's on the post to push it this way. And this is going to go and keep tension of it on the other way, just like this. See that? break the barrel open the tension over here is pushing it this way and now we can't fire it when i go like this um <clears throat> basically this gets pulled back up to here so actually it's just this part here that has the tension and then this basically pulls the thing back to get it in another position and this is just sitting here because that's where they decided to keep it to keep everything retained and that's pretty much it in a nutshell. So we're going to find out. Now, there is one thing left, or a couple things left, before you put the stock on. And you'll see on this gun, at least, there are three notches here for this U-shaped guide. Then that guide is to keep this from getting gouged up when, when the cock and arm rides back and forth. Now, you can't put it here because obviously it's going to fall through where the forks are. And I don't think you can put it here on this one because when this comes over back like that, it's going to fall through into the receiver. So you're going to have to put it on the middle one. So I'm going to lift this up. This is a little chewed up because it's basically rinky dink. We're going to get it on there. 
like such. And we're going to push it down and now she's in. So there it is there in a nutshell. Now you have one little guy left and that's this guy and this guy wants to fall off of the gun. It goes on one way better than the other. So watch this. I put it on. It won't go back all the way. I turn it around and now it goes on all the way up to here. That's probably because it's recessed a little bit. Yes, it is. So there, that's what you want all the way up against this arm. And now at this point, you're ready to put the stock on. So make sure your pins are even on the receiver on both sides and not one sticking out more than the other. And put the roller back on because it just fell off. There's that. And we're going to do this off camera. I'm pretty sure you know how to put two screws in the bolt in the back that goes in here. And we'll see where this trigger is and what our chrono right, results are. Here's our chrono are. results see, um, with our crossbin domes, 14.3 grain, um, 0.22 cal. So we have a 583.4 and a 596.7, 589.7. Five eighty one point nine, five eighty three point five, and that's it. Um, basically, I have some copies here. So, but anyway, there it is in a nutshell. We'll see it. Well, the oven temperature is working its way up to three hundred degrees. We are practically there. Let's take a look at the gauge. It swings a little bit, but um, that's close enough. Our parts are inside the spray boot there flashing off. Once that's ready, we can put it in the oven, and then we can get out of here for a whole hour, away from any fumes that could be happening. All right, well, this is a revised edition of this entire video, because I didn't like the end clip. Well, here it is, the BSA Lightning XLSE. One of the things I forgot to put in was the crony results. After all our work, what did we get for the crony results using the Crossman Domes 14.3 grain? Well, we got a smidge under 600 feet per second at my elevation of 3,100 feet above sea level. Now, this particular gun also had a problem towards the end after I got the shroud on. If you remember, we bent the barrel to adjust the point of impact with the zeroed out scope. And we um, are now in line with the zeroed out scope. Isn't that nice? But when we got the shroud all done and back together and Cerakoted, it wasn't shooting where it was when the shroud was off. Now, because we did adjust the barrel, I knew we were going to have to bore out the front caps or else it would clip. So I did that ahead of time. But I did check it and I saw a wee bit of a trace of the line there. So I knew we had to do a little bit more. But I still wasn't getting the same groups as we had it when the shroud was off. So I took the front caps off all together, right, shot again, and then our groups went back to where they should have been. And so I realized it's no longer the front caps. It is a problem with the shroud tube, the size of it, and the air pocket that it has is causing an issue. And for that, I just simply drilled a hole so that the air can escape when you fire uh, out of the tube better. At any rate, that's what I did, and it seemed to fix the problem, and we are back where we need to be. And so now we have a gun, it's all honed in. Now remember, this is a nice hammer forged barrel and we were very lucky. I've never seen a barrel where it was so snug in the pellet area to bore fit in the block area rather and get past it and still have pellet to bore contact. I've never seen that. I expect a total free fall. Now, Air Guns of Arizona has one of these, but it's in a different stock. Maybe the trigger's a little different, but maybe that trigger has screws adjustment for it. I don't know, but it has the longer barrel, and that particular model has the gas ram also. And the stock's not bad. It's just not as nice as this one. But um, it also has a barrel pivot bolt that screws in it for 200 bucks shipped. So you can take your chances. The only thing I don't like is you can't rebarrel these. If I want to rebarrel this in a different caliber, say 20 cal, you can't rebarrel it. It's welded to the barrel block. And if you do go and get one of those guns, clean the barrel first, right? Then do the pellet to bore test to see if you have a good pellet to bore fit. And if you don't, send it back. 
because what are you going to do? You got to have a good pellet to bore fit and you got to make sure the barrel's clean. Now, one thing about this particular gun, it's got good groups, right, for the power it has, which is just under 600 feet per second using the Crossman Domes 14.3 grain pellets. Now, as far as shooting, I was grabbing whatever was on the table. They're not Crossman Domes, the sizes are all over the place, they're not sorted. So, you could get better groups with this gun if you sort your pellets and also maybe after you clean the barrel polish the barrel and I bet you you get even better groups the gun feels great to hold it's a shame that it doesn't come with a proper good shooting trigger you know they throw all this stuff with the air guns you see people do videos of these guns and half of them don't know what they're talking about really and it's the way they promote stuff you know sometimes it really gets on your nerves let's be honest right they should have never made a trigger like that for a gun like this they should have had a really nice trigger. It would have brought the gun around the full circle. Even with the crappy hard piston seal, would have made things a lot better with this gun. But this is how they cheap out. Now, this gun is not cheap, right? You paid some good money for this gun. And that's ridiculous because it's not worth it. It may look nice, right? But really, in the end of, the end of all things, you get what you get and you got to deal with it. But at any rate, there, that's enough said. <clears throat> so I think I covered everything, <clears throat> but I want to talk about the adjustment screw. Excuse me. It's Thanksgiving morning. I'm trying to get this done because I got things to do. But um, the adjustment screw for the sear engagement. Now, the trigger in this is almost like they made it for a toy, to be very honest. It's very, very uh, tricky, so be very careful. So I did take the factory screw out. Originally, I had a long one. Then I took the long one out, put the factory one back bottomed it out like it was before, and then I wasn't satisfied when I went to actually shoot for groups. When I shot over the crony for the pellet trap, it was fine, but sitting down for groups, all of a sudden, you can feel that now the trigger is not as nice as you want it to be. So I went to Ace Hardware and I got a little bit of a longer screw. Now this screw, from the thread to the bottom underside of the head, where it would bottom out, was 276 thousandths of an inch, right? So the one I got from the Ace Hardware turned out to be just a smidge over 300 thousandths. So you're only talking around 30 thousandths more of a longer screw over the factory screw. Now with that, I stuck it in, bottomed it out, even put some blue Loctite in with it. But if you're gonna mess with this and you're gonna mess with that trigger sear engagement screw by putting a different one in, make sure when you load it and you go to close that barrel, it's in a safe area. If the gun goes off, it won't hurt nothing. But close that barrel hard. See if you can make it misfire, right? Don't go crazy, crazy, but just do it hard enough to where if it's gonna misfire, it's gonna do it. And I'll do that maybe three times. And if it doesn't misfire, then you know you're still good. But this had misfired only a couple times during the processes of trying to figure this trigger out. Well, with that said, good luck. If you have one, a lot of guys like these. Um, they're light, so to speak. And, you know, they're good looking and they feel good to hold. And it's actually a nice looking gun. With that, have a nice holiday. Be safe. Take care. And we'll see you on the next one. Maybe a Diana 34 where we're going to rebarrel in 20 cal and then do our thing to it. See ya.